James Bradley, welcome to Booktopia. Thank you, it's great to be here. Your book's called Clade. What does that mean? Uh, a clay, a clay is a biological term. Uh, it means a group of organisms with a common ancestor. Um, uh, in the book, it's because the book is about a family kind of heading through time, so it's, it, it's following them from this kind of common ancestor. So we we talked about um, uh, we're, we're talking about time, and and the book is set in the near future, and then projects beyond that. How did you decide how to frame the time that you wanted to? focus on and how far forward to go? Look, it begins next year. I mean, it, it kind of begins now, just a, a few months in the future, and it goes about 60 or 70 years into the future. I was constrained a bit by the fact that, you know, there's a main character that you see at the beginning and at the end, so there was sort of one person's life. Um, but I think what I wanted to do, one of the things I, I wanted to do with the book was to give a sense of the kind of passage of time and of the way the world changes around the characters, because one of the things the book's very much about, it's about this kind of changing world that they're living in and watching the way their lives are affected by that, but also the way that, I guess, their lives intersect with that in mm -hmm. different ways. It's also significant to me, though, that um, since your last book, The Resurrectionist, you've become a parent, and this is very much about children and parents and the sort of uh, longevity genetically and in other ways of certain traits and circumstances and what generations are going to inherit from the problems that we're facing today. So do you think that becoming a father has made you think much more acutely about the future? Absolutely. The book's actually dedicated to my daughters. Um, I have two daughters. Um, I think I think one of the the things that I wanted the book to do was to give a sense of the way, but both as you say, the, the challenges we face and the, the the things that are going on, but also to give a sense of the way that I guess the future is not set. We can control the future. We can remake the future, and that the future is full of possibility as well as full of problems. Um, and I do think that that thing about writing about having had children did change it because I, I think you become incredibly acutely aware of the world you're giving to your children and I think like a lot of people I look at particularly the environmental things around us and just think what are we giving to our children and I think like a lot of people I feel incredibly powerless to affect that um, and I guess you know I'm a writer I, I, I can't go out and direct my multinational company to reinvest its money elsewhere but you know I can, I can write a book. So you can, re you can write scenarios which are almost a kind of warning, a kind of cautionary tale which is saying in a way, is this the future we want our children to have to live through and manage? Absolutely. And that's one of the things the book does. I mean, there are various disasters and things in it, although I must say one of the things I wanted not to do was to write an apocalyptic or a dystopian book. I wanted to write a book that deliberately resisted that because I actually think there's a kind of abdication of imagination and responsibility. You know, looking at the world and saying the world will end is about saying there's nothing we can do about mm -hmm. it. Looking at the world and saying this is what the world might be and also kind of thinking about how we can repossess that was something that I was really interested in. And you, you asked before about the, the, the time span in the book and one of the things I'm, I'm really interested in is we talk about what will happen next year, what will happen in five years. We don't think very often about you know, the deep future. You know, what, what are things going to be like in a hundred years, mm -hmm. in a thousand years, in ten thousand years? And once you start asking those kinds of questions, you suddenly realise that so many of the things we think matter now will just kind of melt away. You know, so that's, that, that's one of the things I wanted to try and get at. Those kind of questions give a real hint of how ambitious this book is. I mean, I made a list off the cuff this morning. So we've got a deadly virus, colony collapse amongst bees, uh, infertility, autism, eco-refugees, technology and astronomy. It would be easier in a way for us to talk about what's not in this book. I mean, this is a very, very ambitious spectrum that you're covering, isn't it? So what, how did you wrap your head around so many different subjects in a way that allowed you to write authoritatively as well as speculatively? Look, I think one of the things I, I was doing when I was trying to write the book was not to write an issue book. You know, I didn't write, want to write a book which was about rattling through issues. So lots of those things are in there, but I wanted to write a book where a lot of that stuff was in the background. So it was, you know, it, 
that it's all there, but it's all kind of mixed into it. Because I was really interested in the idea of writing a book about saying, you know, the future is no one thing. The future is lots of things. You know, the future is everything happening at once, just like the present is. Um, but I, I, I think also there was something about trying to say, I mean, one of the things I, I did when I wrote it was I, I'd been writing another book which I'd, I'd been having some problems with and I wanted to find a way of writing a book which, in a sense, I allowed myself to develop as I went along. So I had a kind of framework and I knew, I knew what some of the points in the framework were, but I kind of filled the bits in as I went along. So there, there was a kind of process of trying to build something that was kind of like a uh, I, I guess like a collage, which is one of the things the book does. I mean, because you've got all of these sections, there's big jumps of time between them. You see the characters change in different kinds of ways. And I guess what I want to do is to get the reader to make some of those connections between between the pieces. And, and in a way, when you read the book, you'll see that lots of the big stuff actually happens in the background. You don't see it. You know, 10 years have gone by and things have completely changed, which is one of the things I wanted to get, that sense of life changing, life moving on, life moving on all the time, because that's what the book's about. It's about the fact that life moves on all the time. And you said before that you didn't want to write something post-apocalyptic. So I, I get that there's very much a kind of a... There's, there's room for cautious optimism in this book. Uh, what would you say are the main reasons to be cheerful about the future? Um, <laughs> I, I'm not sure that there are reasons to be cheerful about the future, but I, look, it was really important to me... You know. I, I get really worried about this tendency, as I said before, to kind of look at the future and see disaster. You know, because there's lots of things to be really frightened about. But the fact of the matter is, I actually don't think that, you know, the billions of people on the planet are all going to disappear. One of the things we have to work out how to do is to actually manage that, to deal with it. And, you know, I do think that there is, there is movement on fronts where that will get better. I mean, I think things are going to get worse before they get better. Right. But you've got to be hopeful about the future. You, you can't not be hopeful about the future because if you stop hoping about the future, you've given up. Is the solution life on another planet? Um, <laughs> well, we need to get there first. Um, I, I could give you my riff on terraforming, but I won't. Um, uh, no, I mean, I think this is the solutions we have to work how to live on this planet. Mm -hmm. That's a good place to stop. <laughs> Thank you very much, James Bradley. Thank you. <laughs>